Donald. I, I lead uh, our boardroom program. I'm the partner sponsor in relation to it. Uh, and I'm a partner uh, in the firm for uh, 20 years and have been leading this program since, since its inception. Um, delighted that we're also being joined this morning and thanks again to Chapter Zero that this session is being done in, in collaboration with them and we thank them for their support. Uh, my fellow panelists today are Glenn Gillard, who is our sustainability leader for the firm. Uh, Glenn has been involved in sustainability in his public policy role within Deloitte and liaising with the EU Policy Centre on response, uh, particularly in consultations in relation to CSRD uh, and other regulators in relation to sustainability assurance, which you'll see threads its way into the responsibilities of directors as we come to that. Uh, Glenn is also on the board of Chapter Zero Ireland, and he's an elected council member of Chartered Accountants Ireland uh, and chairs its education board of Chartered Accountants Ireland, where he's been part of that for a number of years. And they're rolling out the uh, Chartered Accountants Sustainability Certificate uh, at the moment. Uh, we'll be joined um, by also by Melissa Gully, who is a Centre of Corporate Governance Lead. Melissa has over 12 years experience in advising boards, C-suites and company sec in a range of topics on board effectiveness, governance, risk management, culture, uh, corporate social responsibility and sustainability. And also, and last but not least, uh, Mark Abood is joining us. He's our sustainability regulatory lead uh, and he is the company secretary of Chapter Zero Ireland. Mark is a director within the firm and leads out on sustainability regulation and the reporting thereof. Uh, in terms of questions, if you'd like to answer, ask any questions, do pop them into the into the questions uh, uh, tab on on Zoom, um, and I'll I'll raise those uh, to, at the end of the session. Just to give you prior notice, our final webinar series will be held on the twenty first of October at eleven a.m. Uh, on the topic of implementing trustworthy AI. So I think. Uh, the registration links for that will be on our website uh, uh, and we'll also reach out to people who, who are joining us today and on our list. But do feel free to forward those on to people who, in your organization or our organizations who you may think would find that useful. So I think we're, we're hitting uh, AI and sustainability uh, within a month and a half. So we're hitting the two hot topics uh, of many boardrooms and as they consider how they lead their way through into the final part of many financial years. With that, I'll pass you over to Glenn. Thanks, Colin, and uh, welcome to everyone today. And it's great to be doing this in conjunction with uh, the Chapter Zero uh, Ireland uh, um, chapter. Uh, it has been a really interesting year in terms of you know, the activity of Chapter Zero on, it's been great to be able to support Chapter Zero through the events that we've done through the year uh, so far. And so particularly if anyone um, on, on, on the call today is not part of Chapter Zero or the Chapter Zero uh, uh, group, please do look to to, to join and, and it's open to all non-executive directors um, as we build a community of, I suppose, interested and motivated uh, um, non-executive directors with a passion for ESG so moving really to that that role of the board, and, and this is you know a rather simple diagram uh, to to sort of illustrate maybe some of the themes that are happening. Obviously, at the at the top of the pyramid for for any board is you know setting setting strategy and and, and overseeing that strategy. And when we look at the last twelve months, you know that that discussion or that challenge around setting strategy in the context of ESG has probably uh, become more com complex and more complicated over that period of time. Um, what we've seen is, you know, the geopolitical uh, environment really creating different dynamics in terms of particularly, um, you know, east-west, but, but also uh, um, west and, 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 and Asia in terms of um, different views of, of where our path is, with Europe, I suppose, being the strongest voice in terms of our path to net zero, particularly. Um, and as we've seen coming out of the, the, the European elections, probably a reinforcement again around uh, the, the, the path for Europe. But it is a very complicated uh, view when we look at it globally. And that has definitely caused challenges for, for boards in terms of, of really being clear around what that strategy is, 
how they're going to execute it, and how do they manage those differing sort of stakeholders uh, in terms of that complicated environment. And that really probably brings me to the bottom of, of, of that pyramid, because I think two things over the past 12 months that are probably driving most boards' uh, um, sort of short-term activity or short-term uh, uh, strategic priorities in terms of ESG are under those two pillars of, of risk and, and reporting. So clearly, you know, a, a standard part of, of, of the board's agenda in terms of understanding and, and, and managing risk, but also um, the focus of, of the board on, you know, what gets uh, um, reported on, gets actioned on, so risk and reporting. So I might just um, talk a little bit about, I suppose, what, what we're seeing over the last 12 months in terms of that risk focus of, of boards and, and, and how that's influencing maybe how we're looking at strategy. I think for, for most organisations, if, if we say in that, that previous slide, um, Ruth, so when when we talk about uh, when we talk about risk, you know, typically, you know, where uh, uh, boards are most focused uh, is around some of those short term risks, and particularly when we look at the physical risks and the and the uh, uh, and the physical risks related to ESG. So we're seeing that through disrupted supply chain, you know, impact of um, heat waves on on on, on water shortage, etc. And so that has really driven a lot of of, of boards' agendas managing those those short-term uh, risks in terms of how they're manifesting into the business. Um, but obviously, the other key focus is, is understanding those transition risks, what's actually happening in terms of saying, well, as we transition to a greener economy, um, how am I thinking about those transition risks? Which has definitely been more complicated by, as I say, that, that uh, very sort of geopolitical outlook in terms of saying, well, what is that path that we're on? Are we on a net zero path, how fast are we going to that net zero path and how real are some of those transition risks? And that has made it difficult for, for boards to make decisions around short-term strategic choices when we look at transition. So investment into greener technologies, uh, allocating capital and making those commitments. But I think two things really have probably put that uh, uh, closer to the fore in terms of short-term decision-making. One is emerging regulation. So um, what's forcing, uh, I suppose, transition thinking within boards is definitely around immin imminency of particular regulation. So be that poten potentially, you know, deforest deforestation regulation impacting, be it due diligence directive impacting, be it plastics directives, different things that are directly impacting on the cost of delivering your business be that energy policy or energy decisions in, in the in the, in the GOC are acting in. And I think that regulation, the challenge for a lot of organisations is that that's not a smooth um, uh, uh, trajectory in all geographies that you're operating. So we're seeing certain, uh, certain jurisdictions running ahead with specific types of regulation compared to others, and therefore trying to manage that and build that into your strategic planning to say, well, how are we going to adapt or adopt our current uh, strategy to take into account those emerging regulation as part of it and the cost of doing business that comes with that? How are we adapting our products or services to make sure that they're going to still be profitable and cost efficient with that uh, changing regulation as part of that? So um, that short term, what regulation is hitting us over the next number of years impacting onto the strategic direction is really where a lot of organizations are trying to look at in terms of managing that transition risk um, or the risks related to, I suppose, how different economies are moving towards a greener economy in, in, in the short term. I think related to that then, the other most significant and emerging risk that has probably manifest itself over the last 12 months has been around the reputational risks. And that's the, the the complicated discussion around, you know, um, greenwashing, green hushing, and, and really what are people saying out in the marketplace and how is that perceived then with investor stakeholder uh, um, communities, with employees, with others. And we've seen how that is a, is, is a challenge, trying to put a, a particular message for an audience in the U.S., compared to a message for an audience in, in Europe for, for different pieces around that. And we've seen reputational risk really move up the agenda and really linked to the, the final pillar on the page there around reporting. Because I would say that in the last 12 months, 
probably the single biggest impact on boards in terms of their thinking around um, strategy and uh, and ESG has been the reporting developments and and how we're looking at reporting. That's really been driven driven in Europe through CSRD creating an imperative around around action from a, a reporting point of view. Um, but it's impacting globally because what we've seen is the interconnectedness of the European reporting requirements to sort of global uh, uh, responsibilities. Um, what's interesting as we look at that from a reporting point of view and those drivers for, from a board point of view, it's really asking two sort of key questions for boards. One is, are you prepared to report? So do you have the infrastructure in place? Do you have the, the process in place to allow you report under these new requirements? And then the second fundamental question that it's asking is, what are you prepared to report? So what is the story that you want to tell or are prepared to tell out there? And that goes back to that reputational point around, you know, we've seen people step back maybe from some of their public commitments when we look at it in terms of saying, well, are we really able to say that? Do we really want to say that? And how are we saying that? So reporting, creating a requirement to really tell your story, put information out there in the public domain. And actually for boards, the big question is, well, I'm going to have to report this information, but how am I actually managing how that information is going to influence my business? And that really circles back into that discussion around you know, that longer term strategy and, 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 and how it's coming through. So I'm just going to pause a little bit on, on, on the reporting piece as well, just to see what's coming out of some of some of the work that we've done around understanding where people are at from a reporting point of view. So, Ruth, you might go on to the, the next slide there. So we, we did a, a survey earlier this year as part of uh, our sustainability uh, action reporting that we do. So global report um, where we We've been doing this for the last couple of years, really focus on the reporting piece and really the readiness for sustainability reporting as part of that. And, you know, three themes came out of out of the report that that, that uh, are the work in the surveys that we did. The first, uh, I suppose, reflection from that was that this has been a year of capacity building for organizations in the reporting area. So, as I said, you know, one of those challenges for for organizations is are you ready to report? Are you prepared to report? And we've seen that happening now as, as organizations have put ESG reporting as one of their key strategic priorities. So when we look at key projects and key programs that need to be executed on in the next uh, 12 to 24 months, ESG reporting is up there in sort of the top five of, 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 um, of initiatives as part of that. So in terms of investing in that capacity building, what are we seeing from the, from the organizations that we've talked to around this? Probably a few things. We've seen people look at how they're structured in terms of ESG reporting. So we've seen the, um, the evolution of ESG councils, so cross-functional groups that are focused on looking at reporting across the organization. Um, so in our, in our survey, more than 50% of, of organizations now have cross-functional ESG councils that are focused on um on reporting in, in some shape or form. Um, we're seeing clearly that it, organizations have invested in the CSO role. So organizations that previously didn't have CSOs now have chief sustainability officers, but also into the sustainability reporting team. So putting resources in place there, heads of sustainability reporting becoming a, a key part of, of, of the internal teams of organizations. And when we look at that, uh, um, that uh, you know, focus on capability or cap capacity building, what we've also seen is who's taking ownership of the uh, reporting challenge within business, within businesses and organisations. So what we have seen is, not unsurprisingly, the CSO has typically been one of the key executives sponsoring uh, uh, sustainability reporting. But what we've seen through our surveys and what we've observed in, in working with organizations is, is sort of two other key um, uh, key stakeholders really uh, vying for, for ownership of the C ESG reporting agenda. And that's the general counsel and the CFO. So general counsel may seem surprising, but it really does come back to that risk that I talked about, again, around reputational risk. Um, 
general counsel, particularly with a with, with a, a, a North American slant, you know, really having a, a, an important role in understanding what are we going to say and where are we saying it and do we have a consistent message? So really trying to manage the 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 reputational risks related to to the reporting and particularly those considerations around greenwashing and, uh, and green hushing. Um, the CFO clearly stepping in as we move into sort of uh, reporting, particularly reporting within annual reports, the CFO having a greater uh, um, a greater stake in the reporting uh, um, landscape, particularly that interaction with audit committee. But I think the other key thing that's coming out of what we've seen over the last 12 months, particularly and around CSRD reporting in particular, is the uh, the prominence of data and the accuracy of data used within ESG reporting. And the CFO, as that sort of owner of, I suppose, the the, the data within organisations and particularly financial data and how that interacts with the non-financial data has had an increasing role within the sustainability reporting landscape. I do think that does come back again to a discussion we'll pick up later when Mark talks a bit more about some of the uh, the wider themes that are coming through our CXO survey. Um, we will see that you know the role of the the, the CFO around capital allocation, around decisions around funding and financing are sort of key as we look at that. From a board perspective, when we look at that capacity building uh, of organisations, what we are seeing is, you know, that generally speaking, organisations are giving the board that broad oversight of sustainability reporting. So in many cases at the moment, and this probably reflects uh, where we sit in terms of the, the importance of uh, the reporting landscape, that the full board has some element of oversight of the CSRD reporting uh, journey or the ESG reporting journey. So it, it, it's, it's not just sitting down in subcommittee, but there is an overall level of, of, of full board um, oversight or, or, or understanding of that. But definitely with a, with a piece of pushing down into the relevant board committees. So audit and risk committee taking on a greater role around um, reporting that's going to impact on the annual report uh, or on the financial statements of an organization. Um, but, you know, uh, governance and, and, and nomination and remuneration committees focusing a lot on targets, actions and and uh, and how they impact on, on pay, but also on overall governance in terms of um, reporting that's out to the public. We've also seen that sort of uh, continued uh, evolution of uh, dedicated sustainability committees. And, and 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 that has probably been one of the things that um, has created a good bit of challenge for boards in determining, well, how do we allocate responsibilities between things like our audit and risk committee, between a sustainability committee, between the main board? What we're probably seeing with uh, um, with with forward-looking uh, uh, boards is that they definitely use the sustainability committee to help in terms of looking at the longer term time horizons and particularly to um, to explore some of the different uh, uh, scenarios that could manifest itself over time and deep diving into the, the, the longer term time horizon uh, while leaving some of the more compliance driven requirements and short term requirements to audit and risk committee in terms of meeting immediate reporting requirements. So definitely, as I say, a year of, of, of capacity building and a year of, of investment into the reporting capabilities within organizations. I think what we're also seeing is, you know, that recognition through that process of, of understanding the requirements and understanding what needs to be reported on is that organizations are understanding uh, and recognizing that there are benefits to the investment in that sustainability reporting uh, infrastructure. Some of that is 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 simple, and it's sort of the 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 corollary of some of the risks that are there. So you know, by um, investing in in understanding your reporting, understanding how you're going to report, it also reduces risk related to non-compliance with with uh, uh, requirements, but also risk around not being able to um, tell your story as you want to tell that story. Definitely, people are seeing that the, the benefit around. The brand benefit, so the 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 corollary of that sort of re reputational risk that there's a brand enhancing piece if you can get the sustainability reporting right, and that's coming through to to talent attraction as well as we see that. But there's also a big piece here around 
efficiency. Uh, what we are seeing is that the burden of sustainability reporting is significant and actually becoming more complex. So we can take something like CSRD reporting in Europe, but then we add on to that different reporting in different jurisdictions uh, from a reporting point of view, but then add in reporting to suppliers, reporting to, to, to customers, and the, the ever-growing complexity of the reporting requirements that are being driven out and the flexibility needed to be able to report different types of information to different stakeholder groups uh, within an organisation. So investing in that sustainability reporting infrastructure is seen as an investment into the effectiveness and efficiency of the organisation. Uh, and looking at that, particularly where there's initiatives around data transformation, around finance transformation, where ESG needs to be part of that discussion to maximise the benefits from those programmes. I think the third probably reflection coming out of our, our, our surveys uh, with, with, um, with organisations is that while organisations have made a lot of progress around reporting uh, and, and getting ready for reporting, there is still a significant challenge around the data quality for, for companies and how prepared, therefore, organisations are for reporting, particularly highlighting the challenge around scope three GHG emissions. So you know, we've had a lot of reporting by organisations around their scope one and scope two emissions, but moving to, a, to, to being able to report uh, with actually in confidence around scope three emissions is something that's really challenging organisations. And that also challenges how that organization looks around its longer term net zero targets and its pathways to net zero when you're trying to get your arms around the accuracy of what you're reporting from a, a scope three point of view. And I think that feeds into one of the other key challenges in terms of that significant progress. While a lot of organizations have you know, plans and targets in place, actually the 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 um the specificity of those plans and targets is being challenged through the reporting process. So actually, you know, are these targets properly quantified? Are they properly articulated? To what extent do you understand how those uh, um, those um, actions that you're taking will impact on those particular targets over time and the levers that you're pulling? Um, and that really comes back to that strategic question for the board is, do we understand how the actions that we're taking are going to impact on our ability to achieve our targets? And what information are we using to ensure that we're allocating our capital in the right way to make the biggest impact in terms of those uh, net zero pathways or the action plans that we have around uh, emissions reductions or uh, um, reducing our, our, our carbon footprint? So, um, when we look overall then at, at sort of, you know, what's on, uh, you know, a good board's agenda. So stepping a little bit away from the pure reporting piece, some work that we've done in Australia has, has probably um, highlighted what some of the, 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 the sort of the leading boards are, are looking at in terms of how they come through. And this is going to lead into the section that Mark then takes on to, to, to look at some of the output of our sustainability CXO uh, survey that we just released in the last um, couple of weeks. So a couple of things at the at the broader level in terms of in terms of uh, you know good board and, and, and good chair of board. I suppose one is moving away from that compliance mentality, which at the moment may be driven a lot by uh, regulatory compliance to embed sustainability more into day-to-day uh, -day, uh, activity and decision making. I think one of the key you know, roles of the board uh, is to ensure that there is that uh, enabling of effective capital allocation, the decisions being made around where capital is being allocated to make the most of um, the investments uh, and, and the limited resources of organizations to, to impact and transition. That point of, of, of curiosity, curiosity trumping mastery, one of the things we've seen uh, better boards doing is having that time or making that time to deep dive into some of the scenarios and pathways to ensure that there's a good understanding of you know the the, the potential variability and the potential pathways that are out there in the future. I think what we've seen is boards don't necessarily today have all of the skills to understand some of the future impacts of climate, particularly. 
and actually bringing in that external expertise and using deep dive workshops to help uh, bring that and not about getting to a view of a single answer, but really prompting that sort of core discussion within the organization around the strategy that's there and the adaptability of that strategy to future changes or shocks. Which leads to that point of trying to identify tomorrow's requirements today, you know, that that looking forward and saying, well, outside of the, the immediate, what will be the change that will happen as we look at those different different pieces? Clearly, the, the, the role of the board and the chair is to try and be that agent of change within the organization to, 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 to push that forward. Um, and looking at trying to bring some of those um, um, outlier thinking into some of the, 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 the discussions, into those deep dives to make sure what's there. Because what we do know within a, particularly within a climate agenda is that there are a lot of potential different or new technologies, new avenues, new uh, um, uh, considerations that could actually have a big influence in the future if they come through. We talk about things like hydrogen, we talk about things like uh, uh, carbon capture solutions, different things that may have a, a significant impact in, in the future. I think this final piece for a, for a board, that bringing a systems thinking lens, like we see it through the reporting, that need to think about up your value chain, down your value chain, and actually thinking about how the organization sits within that wider um, ecosystem and actually the, 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 the need for those other actors or to influence those other actors in the system to allow for, uh, for holistic change. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there and, 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 and hand over to Mark now to take us into some detail around our CXO uh, surveys. Thanks, Glenn, and thanks, Colin. Delighted to be here and delighted to be doing this in conjunction with Chapter Zero Ireland as well. It's definitely very proud and honoured to be involved with that organisation over the last number of years. So, Ruth, maybe moving on to the next slide. And what I'm going to do over the next couple of minutes is um, introduce a report, uh, Deloitte CXO Sustainability Report, where we surveyed over 2,000 executives um, across nearly 30 countries representing multiple industries and although targeted at the, the C-suite, uh, highly relevant and pertinent as well for you and your roles as board directors. And, and as Glenn said, like one of the key themes that we've seen come out of this report and probably complementary to what, what Glenn was saying as well, is that we're seeing, starting to see that shift from just a compliance focus um, uh, where executives are realising uh, there's the business opportunity in the transition to a low emissions future. And we're seeing five underlying themes that have come out of that report and that, and that particular survey. So one being sustainability action is growing with increased investments. Two, uh, shifting to a low emissions economy presents business potential, driving new products, business models and value creation. Three, climate action spurs innovation and technology investments, enabling solutions with environmental and business benefits. Four, an uneven landscape of climate action poses risks so a go-slow approach can lead to competitive disadvantage for your organization. And five, the moderate middle uh, of companies have an opportunity to drive broader action, potentially tipping the balance for rapid change. And I'm going to go through over the next couple of slides some of the statistics that, that, that sit behind some of these themes. But just drawing on the last two, definitely seeing various cohorts of organizations that are out there, some that are taking a slower approach, um, a broader, moderate middle and then those organizations that just have sustainability as a core component of their strategy. And I'll, I'll talk through that in a bit more detail. And we've also included the links to the survey um, and the data points as well to, to this pack as well for, for further reading. So Ruth, just moving on to the first one, and this shouldn't come as a surprise to many, I mean, that climate change is a top three priority for most CXOs. And while the need for uh, the, the, I suppose the most anticipated, most anticipated benefit of climate action for CXOs expect to see over the next five years is actually an innovation around offerings and or operations. And I suppose this underscores the role of climate action in, in driving business value. And as Colly mentioned earlier, innovation, including AI, it's a hot topic. It's an area of focus that we'll have on these board programs going forward. But we'll start to see the interlinkage between those two particular areas over the course of the next couple of years. 
And I think this is probably contrary to some headlines I've seen over the last six months in particular, that there is no retreat from sustainability action by businesses going forward. So we're going to continue to see this as a hot topic and highly pertinent this week during Climate Week in New York. Moving on to the next slide. So 85% have increased sustainability investments, and this has increased um, from 75% last year. So sustainability action is growing and investment in this action is growing as well. So while the need for innovation and technology investment might seem contrary or, or, or seen as a competing priority to climate action, in reality, there are crucial drivers of sustainability efforts, enabling businesses to develop solutions that showcase the potential for new products and services that offer both environmental and business benefits. Moving on to the next slide. So 70% expect climate change to significantly impact strategies and operations over the next three years. And again, this has increased from 61% last year as well. Climate change is a core business issue and the transition to a low emissions economy, or as that unfolds, more companies are seeing the opportunities not only uh, and, and not focusing on the risks only. So the likes of new products, business models, value creation overall, and not just a, a compliance exercise or a reporting exercise. Moving on to the next point. So 92% believe their company can grow uh, while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So this year, uh, more CXOs cite direct environmental and business benefits um, from their sustainability efforts rather than less tangible ones. Customer loyalty, supply chain efficiency, and operating margins are seen more often than just improved brand recognition and reputation, which, as Glenn mentioned, you know, has been quite a large focus on that over the course of the last uh, couple of years. But starting to see an increased focus on the on the other elements as mentioned above. Forty five percent are transforming their business models and strategies to address climate change. So additionally, thirty five percent of organisations have embedded sustainability considerations throughout their organization, although these efforts do not yet impact the core business model. This indicates a widespread acknowledgement of the importance of sustainability within an organization's own operations in itself. And then looking at the interlinkage with, with innovation, and innovation, as, as, as seen earlier, as well as artificial intelligence, ranks ahead of climate change as the number one most pressing issue for CXOs over the next year with 38% listing that as, uh, as top uh, as top within the top three. However, 50% of CXOs have already begun implementing technology solutions to help achieve climate or environmental goals, with another 42% expecting to in the next two years. More than half of those are already leveraging technology and are using it to develop more sustainable products and services. Among leading organizations, 85% are developing new climate-friendly products or services, which was em emphasizing the link between the innovation elements and climate action. And then 17% uh, of organizations, so looking at this bell curve here at the bottom left-hand corner, 17% of organizations are ahead of the curve, um, implementing four to five harder to implement needle moving sustainability actions, uh, demonstrating a proactive approach to environmental challenges and more likely to view climate action as central to the business strategy. Looking at the left of the curve, despite recognizing the looming impact of climate change on their operations and strategy, there's still a significant portion of organizations that have taken a minimal or no needle moving actions as the world moves to a net zero economy their go slow approach risks them leaving at a competitive disadvantage. And then the larger moderate middle, so more than half of organizations are focusing on two to three needle moving actions. Many of these organizations fall into two categories. Those that are pursuing the business of sustainability, serving the emerging green economy. And as Glenn mentioned, those that are focused on becoming a sustainable business addressing their own environmental footprint and inf influencing the broader ecosystem uh, from supply chains to society. So that just gives you a sense of some of the, the stats that underpin this report that's actually been launched during this climate week, uh, this week uh, in New York during climate week. So hopefully giving you a, a sneak peek in, in terms of some of those data points. 
but maybe just moving on to the the next slide and some of the recommendations that you can take away and definitely some consistency in terms of the focus areas that Glenn mentioned um, uh, earlier and on his slides. So build on key strengths, prioritize the areas with the greatest near-term potential for impact and create a, a broader foundation for sustainability efforts. So focus area for you as a, 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 with it, within your role as a board member. Consider the full set of pathways to create impact. Organization should, organization should think about um, expansively about how they can extend the reach of their sustainability efforts. An organization's influence and degree of freedom may be greater than initially realized. Three, collaborate beyond the four walls of businesses. Engage with customers, suppliers, regulators, and even competitors to amplify sustainability impacts. Four, explore the full range of benefits uh, to make the business case. Leaders should think broadly about the gains they could see from an expanded ambition. As market and regulatory demands continue to evolve, those who move proactively to put sustainability at the heart of their business will be well positioned to thrive um, in the economy of the future. So with that, I'm going to pause. And here are some links as well that we'll, we'll share with you um, post the session uh, that includes the Sustainability Action Report, membership to Chapters Your Ireland and some useful links and also the CXO survey and some other useful tools like our regulatory timeline tool. Um, but I'll pause and I'll hand over to Melissa who's going to bring us on to the next topic. Great, thanks Mark and good morning everyone. I'm having a few technical issues so I'm going to keep my video off just to make sure that you can all hear me. We've left the fun part until the end, and I'm going to talk about some of the potential implications that we're seeing in this space for directors' duties. So Ruth, if you wouldn't mind. So really, I think Glenn has really set the scene quite nicely talking about that broad responsibility of the board. And I think you'll all as directors be really familiar with the fiduciary responsibilities set out in the Companies Act 20, 2014. And what you'll see is there are these standards seven obligations for directors and they range from acting in good faith in the interests of the company, acting honestly, making sure that you act in accordance with the constitution and then others around avoiding conflicts of interest and indeed having regard to the interests of employees, shareholders and where relevant creditors. I think what's really interesting is we're now seeing quite a shift on positive actions for boards and directors. So really, it's starting to open up a discussion around, is this then going to translate into a new obligation for directors? And when you look across the globe, there's a number of interesting developments that we're starting to see. So really, this positive action on climate is coming from a number of sources and different stakeholders. It's everything from investors to consumers, employees. And we're also then starting to see a number of shareholder and other related actions from non-profit organizations who are specifically targeting companies for breach of particular responsibilities and duties. And some of the examples of those that we're seeing are in the likes of the UK, you had the case where Client Earth, a non-profit organization, took derivative action against the directors of Shell PLC for breach of duties in respect to their their approach to climate strategy. And then similarly, when you look across the globe to Australia, there's been a number of cases by other nonprofits taken against banks for failing to properly manage, manage their material risks related to climate change. So we're definitely, we're starting to see a shift and an increase in litigation, which is starting to open up questions of personal liability for directors. However, what I would say is that it's quite early days in testing these cases, you know, so it's not yet clear what the standard is and how it will be, be seen to then apply going forward. But what I would say to give you all some comfort is that I think when it comes to these type of cases in law, you know, ultimately they are very difficult. Any shareholder actions are quite difficult to prove in the absence of any clear fraud negligence. So I do think it's it's certainly an interesting shift and one will be watching to see where it might go in the next um, you know, foreseeable future. But Ruth, if you're happy to move us to the next slide, you know, what I 
I would really ask you to reflect on, you know, some of the areas Glenn spoke about earlier. And to me, I think for directors, you know, there is a risk of getting overwhelmed with all the regulations and the legislation and the changes. But I think, you know, the best best thing to do is really reflect on the core responsibilities of the board and indeed for individual directors. And in this slide, we, we highlight some of the key areas of focus and a number of them we've touched on earlier in the discussion, but just a couple of other things I would really call out is, is around those stewardship responsibilities. So really making sure that the board are strategically focused and also making sure that the organization has the right capabilities to really navigate and manage these changes. I think also in terms of oversight, making sure that you're getting the right information to really hold management to account and provide you with assurance, again, particularly when there's a lot of change coming down the line. And I'll talk a little bit more on, on what that looks like for an effective board member. And then the last piece, which I think is really important at the moment in the current environment is accountability. So how well the board is proactively managing its stakeholders and ensuring that those key decisions they're taking have considered what the interests of their key stakeholders are, what's material, and that they've also then brought that into their, their thinking. Ruth, if you can take us to the next slide. There are some practical things that you can do and, and add to your toolkit as a director. And I think some of these, certainly with secretariat or governance team support, can really just bring in some practical steps to make sure that as a board, you're spending your time in the right areas. And I think it's everything that we're seeing from reviewing and updating terms of reference and to also then making sure that your forward plans are building in sufficient time to talk about sustainability related topics. And I think what we're going to see in the next 12 months ahead is focus deep dives on particular areas relevant to your business, such as biodiversity. And I think we're also continuing to see the question raised around social impact and, and the social element of ESG and how that features in the board agenda. And then I think another area then coming back to the role of the board and board members is really to be thinking about the relevant policies and, and procedures and how they're aligning from a sustainability perspective with emerging best practice and ensuring that that governance of the organization is aligning with your sustainability strategy and helping you manage those risks. If we move on then, the last area that I'll really just spend a few minutes talking about is, is that concept I referenced earlier about assurance in the context of board member duties. And this is probably one of the key questions I get asked when talking to boards about all of the changes in CSRD and what it means from a reporting perspective, some of which Glenn highlighted earlier. But one of the key challenges we hear is about just the, the number of data points that now particularly audit committees will have to, to review and, and get their heads around. And I think really it's it's critical that board members really step back and think about their responsibilities and what exactly it is they need to get assurance around sustainability and particularly on the reporting element because there's also there's there's a tendency to think that you need to get into all of the detail and i think boards need to take care that they they don't blur that line between executive and non-executive responsibilities and I think this slide is really helpful visual for reminding you what really assurance is, which is that act of feeling confident and that you can explain and, and take information that you've been provided by management and understand the process that's been followed without having to do all of the work yourself. And that's always much harder when, when there's change involved and, and particularly the pace of change that we're seeing at present. I think it's also then useful in that context to think about what's not assurance. So really where assumptions have been formed because there's no evidence to the contrary, or indeed where there's reassurance and you're taking at face value what, what management or others are telling you. So there really is something important about thinking about those key sources of assurance, particularly if you're on an audit committee with some of the reporting requirements coming down the line. And some examples in action to think about are really where 
you can can already rely on a track record that the organisation and, and management team have demonstrated, particularly if they've gone through other regulatory change, and also that you've you're refer referring to other sources, not not simply management. So that may be internal audit, external audit, or other relevant assurance reports. And then I think importantly, you know, a key role of the board is to challenge. But really to think about when you are scrutinizing management, you know, can they give clear explanations for events and reasons why they've they've taken a particular course of action? So really just some practical things to think about when you look at your assurance responsibilities. And then just to finish off, similar to Mark, we've also noted a number of sources and, and reading for the audience. So I think there's a number of articles out that cover director's duties in the context of sustainability and the changes. And also then we've recently from our Deloitte chair had our third blog on, on governance for boards, which talks about social impact. So a few additional reading sources and to support you and, and think about some of the topics discussed. So Ruth, I'll hand over to Colm now. I think yeah. we've got some time for Q and A. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Thank you to to all our speakers. Uh, we have you on spotlight, Melissa, uh, but I'm sure we'll get panel. We'll panel everyone through there now. Um, what I might do is um, start with you, Glenn, just in relation to to you mentioned the sustainability committee, um, and the role. And I was hearing maybe some confusion around roles and responsibilities about committees. Just your views on whether whether they're a good idea. Are you seeing them being effective? Are they ad hoc? You know, what's your views in relation to 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 that? Yeah, no, it's a good question, Colin. In terms of the the the, the different sort of terms of references of of those committees, and and what we have seen is. As, as Melissa was talking about there, when we look at CSRD reporting as a particular requirement that has legislative requirements around roles of, of audit committees in terms of oversight of, you know, the process controls, assurance uh, providers, um, that that's definitely caused some confusion around uh, uh, the roles between maybe an existing sustainability committee. And I think that's really important in terms of then looking at saying, well, what are the different um, committees trying to achieve? So, as I say, we have seen that sort of development where, um, where, for example, the Audit and Risk Committee is taking a more of a compliance-led uh, approach and saying, yes, we are owning that sort of oversight of the reporting process uh, as part of that. But actually, the Sustainability Committee having a much clearer focus around looking at that point around um, policy development, target development, and really acting as a, uh, uh, an additional forum for the board to go that level deeper. So uh, Melissa talked about those deep dives. So um, it gives a bit of space outside of, uh, of the board itself. But as, 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 I, as I mentioned, we are seeing that in some cases, the view is at the moment, well, the full board takes that responsibility and is really looking at that forward-looking piece and doing those deep dives. But what we've seen very effectively is sustainability committees being able to take some of the heavy lifting off the board, but definitely that point around, um, you know, the compliance element of the reporting, moving more into, into the audit uh, committee and, and, and disaggregating those, where we were probably seeing a bit that the sustainability committee was getting a little bit overrun with, with reporting obligations and therefore wasn't actually spending as much time on looking at some of those uh, forward-looking risks and 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 uh, and plans. And in terms of you were mentioning data, which is obviously critical to all success in, in this, what does good look like in relation to what organisations are doing in 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 regard to that? And what spaces are the are the, is the main focus? Yeah, like uh, to say, what does good look like? I think we're still in an emerging uh, uh, place as to what what organisations are trying to trying to do and and look at that. Like I think what what's clear is that you know focusing on what is your current architecture for for data and and making sure you're leveraging that as much as possible is definitely where people are looking at from an efficiency point of view. And as I said earlier, it it's making sure also that. ESG or the considerations of ESG are built into your wider um your wider programs. Mark mentioned in terms of AI, like people are investing in their tools and technology. It's important that ESG is not 
off to the side and people are trying to 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 solutionize for that without understanding the wider context because what we are seeing is things like data warehouses data lakes etc being sort of core core pieces but also the ability to use new technologies to extract information to uh, to synthesize information is really uh, you know is quite powerful within within the ESG space and we're seeing a whole lot of um, of new uh, tools and technologies emerging uh, to support that. So I think the focus is making sure it's integrated with your overall strategy. And, and some of that may be that you need to do tactical things today, um, but that you have a strategic plan. And uh, so effectively don't do it as a, as a separate silo from your wider business transformation around, around data. Yeah, no, appreciate that. And then, Mark, just in relation to this space, we do fall into the trap that this is only about sustainability. It's broader than that. Absolutely. I think, it, no, I suppose, the question around climate change and just having a focus on that as well, and I think that comes down to an organization's materiality assessment, which is, which is you know, far broader. And, you know, what, what are the topics that are deemed to be material for that organization? Um, we saw we saw climate change, and it'll be hard to um, argue climate change not being material for many organisations that um, many individuals on on this forum represent. But I suppose some of the other ones that are that are coming out as as being material on a cons consistent basis are obviously own workforce. So an organisation's own employees reporting on the likes of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, gender diversity, which links to the gender pay gap um, regulations as well from an, from an Irish perspective. But then also something that's becoming a lot more pervasive and we're, we're, we're discussing a lot more with our clients is around human rights and human rights due diligence, particularly in the context of the, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, which is, again, complementary and highly interlinked with um, the, the, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. And, and we'd, we'd um, encourage organizations to look at value chains in the context of the CS triple D as they do their 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 materiality assessments and their assessments um for the for the CSRD as well. So not to look at these as separate regulations, but to take them um take them in tandem. Yeah, some efficiencies. The uh please uh, everyone do put any questions you have into the QA section. Um there is there is a couple of questions there. Glenn, I might ask you in relation to the funds question around uh, firms being proactive and how they're they're focusing in relation to this and uh, which areas, not my space now, which uh, articles they um, uh, are, are taking. Yeah, the, the, the questionnaire is around, you know, rather than just creating regulations that that people then voluntarily adopt into so for example the funds industry you can determine that you're going to have a green fund and be in article uh, 8 or 9 fund but but there's nothing forcing you to make sure that 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 your that your um that that your fund is there well i i think what we are seeing from a from a regulatory point of view is that you know there is a bit of a carrot and stick approach be, being looked at. So some of the the carrot and particularly within the in, in investing space is you know all of the work that the, the EU has been doing around the EU taxonomy uh, to to create as much information as possible to allow for focused investment into into um, in, into uh, areas which are going to uh, impact on climate uh, on climate change. Um, what we are seeing then is is that linking into sort of the incentives and 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 funding uh, that may come through other EU programs. So I think that piece of saying, well, actually, to access some of those funds, some of those uh, initiatives, being able to um, to to do that, there's the, the the sort of the carrot and stick approach there. There's the regulation to say, well, you need to be able to report in a particular way, but then that reporting allows you to access access funds uh, as part of that or access uh, um, in, investor capital through that. I think the other piece is, you know, what we're going to see, particularly as corporates become more accountable through CSRD and corporates are required to give a a, a clear picture around um, their their transition plans, that that is going to force a greater appetite for the the for investment funds to 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 provide um, 
appropriate appropriate vehicles for them. What we've definitely seen in the last 24 months, obviously, has been a, a stepping back from pure green funds. But I don't see that as a step back necessarily from, you know, principles of responsible investing and being able to provide that transparency around how individual portfolios um uh, the composition of those portfolios and how they're going to help individual corporates meet their own uh, uh, GHG emission targets. So, I, I see, you know, that 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 the the impact of each of these different pieces of legislation, while maybe not mandating a, a business to change its business model, that the influence of them together will force changes in business in business model as part of that. Um, but but at the moment, you know, it is it is an element of that carrot and stick in, in, in most cases. And then, Mark, just to, to cover a couple of questions off there, but focusing in on your 17 percent who are the leading lights on the on the on our survey that we will share. Um, looking under the bonnet in relation to that, is there certain industries that are that are out front? Yeah, so so the the, the survey is evenly spread in terms of industry. Um, so what what I can say in terms of the 17 percent and what, what we've seen out in the market as well, those organizations that tend to be leading tend to have sustainability embedded within their strategy. So they don't have a sustainability strategy and then a strategy. Their strategy is sustainable, if that makes sense. So it's embedded to the core. And you'd see also elements in terms of there are organizations that tend to elect or have elected voluntarily for assurance over the past number of years, and it sets them up for success as they roll into a, a, a CSRD or a rolling environment. So I think a message there is to ensure you get um, get get in front of mandatory assurance to get pre-assurance testing as you, as you roll into that that regime. And the, the third the third area that we'd see uh, for that for that seventeen percent um, out in the market would be their leadership team and tone at the top. Uh, for example, their CEO he or she would be quite vocal from a from a sustainability perspective. There tend to be a a board member that's been assigned as well with responsibility for sustainability, and that tone from the top filters down throughout the organisation. So, just to answer Regine's question, not so much from an industry perspective, but in terms of some of the traits. That we'd see for, for that 17 percent okay great we're out of time so apologies if we didn't get a chance to, to answer your questions uh we will we'll come back to you directly in relation to those if you're if you're named up um thank you very much to uh the speakers today really useful to hear um and we'll see you on the 21st of october for our ai session at 11 a.m and the invites will be going out take take care everybody bye-bye <laughs>